This is Ham College, episode 51 for March 31st, 2019. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. Create your own band opening with ICOM's newest SDR transceiver, the IC9700, coming soon. And by hamstudy.org, a great way to study for your next license exam. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. Just never gets old, does it? Well, uh, it, depends on, it depends on who you ask. Ain't that a kick in the head? <laughs> it, ain't it? <laughs> well, uh, we've got some unusual things tonight. We're going to talk about something that's not this week's or this month's subject it's last month so no, we're going back in time going back in time <laughs> gonna do one of those and because I, I found out something good this week you know a couple of things I want to mention before we get started anytime we're doing a live stream we've got the chat room going on at the same time yep you can uh, find it at amateur uh, that's my cue, right? That's your cue, yeah. Okay. Well, you can find it at amateurlogic.tv slash chat. Um, if you're watching the live stream, there's uh, usually some good hijinks going on in there, so you'll be missing half the fun unless you join us in there. That's it. You know, anytime I stop talking, that, that can be that's your That's my cue. cue. Jump yeah. right on in there. Huh? Jump right on in. Well, we've only been doing this for going on 14 years, so I'm just kind of getting the hang of it. Yeah, I know how you feel. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, uh, what did we talk about last month? Well, we talked about uh, decibels and power and amplifier classes, to the best of my recollection and the best I can see that note right there. That's pretty close. Yeah, that's what the note says. <laughs> so, and we did. And we, we didn't talk enough about decibels. Ah, so we're going to do some more decibels. We actually did, but I learned a real neat trick in, oh, yeah. in the past week that I could have learned, oh, a month ago, and we could have had it on last month, but my reading stack was backed up, and I had not got to a particular issue of a magazine I needed to see. I, I read an article that um, Roger Passvin wrote in the uh, January-February Radio Guide magazine. You remember Ray Top, our friend Ray Top? Mm -hmm. and, um, was it Radio Guide then, or was it Radio Shopper? We used to advertise. I think that. it's Radio Shopper. It's Radio Shopper. They're the same magazines, just uh, mm -hmm. okay. our same publishers, but uh, changed format a little bit. I actually wrote a few articles back in, in 20 years ago in there. Oh, cool. Um, but I didn't write one like this. I didn't even know about this that, that I'm fixing to show you here. Let me slide some things out of the way because I'm going to need a little room. Decibels, you know, that's a hard thing to calculate because you got to use logarithms. Mm -hmm. So either you got to have a lookup table to figure out uh, power ratios or voltage ratios, or you got to do, uh, or you got to have a calculator that's got some. Uh, logarithmic functions on it such, right. you know so can you do it in your head with no calculator or slide rule at all doubtful doubtful that's what i thought never would have been attempted I'm not sure i would even try well, I, i'm not sure i'd trust the result let's put it that way well i'm about to try okay and the ones i'm going to try <laughs> actually tested the results based uh, against an online calculator just to see if I came up with the same results, and I did, very close. Oh, cool. So what I'm going to tell you about here is a good way to to quickly solve some uh, decibel gains or losses in your head 
kind of give you an idea of... I have a lot of losses in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not, not, much, not much gains in anymore. In my pocket. You know? Yeah, I got those too. We're going to talk about some power ratios. We just looked at that chart last week. Say we had um, three dB. It felt like last month. I think it, I think you're right. Three dB. How much would we increase power if we increased it by three dB? You should double, remember this. Double. You would double it times two. That would be uh, if we had a three dB increase, mm -hmm. we would multiply whatever our power was by two. What if we had say uh, six dB increase? How much would we increase our power for that? Times four. What if it's, uh, let's say if it was 10 dB, how much would we increase our power if we had a 10 dB gain? 10? That's right, 10. Wow, So it's all coming clear to me now. That's all you need to know. If you know those three there, you can get pretty close to calculating out some dB losses and gains for power in your head. You might ask, how do you do that? You took the words right out of my mouth. How do you do that? You were thinking the same thing I was. I, I was. Well, you remember those th three things. 3 dB is uh, 2 times 6 dB. It's 4 times 10 dB. It's 10, ten times. times. I've got some examples here I want to run by you. And uh, there will be a test, but I think, you'll, I think you'll pass it. First example here, let's say we've got a 5-watt transmitter. And we've got an antenna that's got a gain of uh, 16 dB. We want to know our effective radiated power will be off of that antenna. We're only putting in 5 watts, but we got a 16 dB gain. How could we quickly figure that out in our head? 6 was 4 times. 10 dB was 10 times. So that's, uh, would it be 5 times 14? Well, let's see. That seems too easy. What, what would be 5 times 14? I just so happen to have my Apple calculator here. Well, let's let's see what it says there. 70. 70. Well, let's see. Uh, actually, no, because it's not. Yeah, it's not linear. Stories. You know, it's, yeah. it's that the logarithmic thing throws it off. But uh, never fear, there is an easy way to solve this. What we got to do is break it down. We know we've got three values we can work with. We can work with 3 dB, 6 dB, or 10 dB because we remember what those three are. So the first one we're going to figure out for the first 10 dB here, what we're going to do is take our 5 watts and we're going to multiply that by 10 for, 50 watts. for 10 dB. 50 watts, okay. Now, we've still got 6 dB left. So 4 times 200 watts? Well, we take our 50 watts, multiply it by 4, and there you're right, 200 watts. So we get 200 mm. watts effective radiated power with only 5 watts in if we've got a 16 dB gain antenna. Oh, wow. That was pretty simple, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. You satisfied that that's correct? If you say so. It looks, it looks like it's, it's correct. what the professor says. Well, there you go. I checked it on the internet, so you the know dean, it's got to be right. It's got the dean's seal of approval. <laughs> okay. Here, <good. laughs> For what that's worth. <laughs> <laughs> well, true. Let's say we got, again, a 5-watt transmitter. And let's say we got an antenna gain of uh, 7 dB. That would be plus 7, of course. How would you go about figuring this one out? I guess you would uh, break it. Break it down. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Well, we got 3 dB and 6 dB. That's 9. That won't work. Yeah, and 10. Those are the three figures we can work with. So I guess we'd have to go with uh, 6 dB for times 4, which would be 20, and then divide and get the fraction for the other 1 dB. Then no. No? Didn't you well, this, is, this one is tricky here. Yeah. Uh, Math this is one, hard. <laughs> the, yeah, the first thing we've got to do is uh, calculate out for 10 dB. Okay. Our 5 watts times, that's times 10, isn't it? And so that's going to give us 50. 50 watts. So we got 10 dB there, but that's more than we need. We've got to have numbers divisible by 3, 6, or 10 here. Mm -hmm. 
We can subtract 3 dB from 10, and we got 7 dB, don't we? Oh, yeah. That's what we got to do is uh, subtract 3 dB. Which would have been 10 watts. All right, so we got our 50 watts, which we've just calculated. And we're going to divide that by, well, 3 dB, that's a, a ratio of 2, isn't it? So we divide that by 2. That's going would to you give not us, subtract? Would you not subtract? I, I just... No, yeah, it's going to give us 25 watts. No, you don't. That's what's tricky about it. We've got 10 dB to start with, but to reduce that down by 3 dB, we actually have to divide the 50 by 3 dB, which is divided by 2. That is kind of tricky there. Okay. You know, on the last one, we, we took the math, and we took the 50 watts, and we wanted to increase it by 6 dB, so we multiplied it by 4. We didn't add... 4 dB to it. We multiplied what we had got by 4. Mm -hmm. That's that's the trick to making this work out. So that gives us 25 watts. So you may say, is, is there any more but wait, variations? But of, wait, there is more. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm glad you, <laughs> you recognize that because I got more to talk about. Okay. Let's make it a little more interesting. I'm not looking at the chat room, so I don't know uh, they're mm -hmm. not saying a whole lot in there right now. They're okay. just doing, they all work in the calculators. That the means it's getting good to them. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, that's pretty sure that's what that means. That means they had never seen this these tricks before either. Yeah. And so I thought it was pretty amazing stuff. That's why I wanted to share it here. All right, let's <laughs> let's say we got a hundred watt transmitter. <laughs> And we got an antenna that's got a zero dB of gain. Let's say we're going to use 163 feet of RG58 cable, 440 megahertz. That's going to give you a line loss of 9 dB. I calculated that out just to see. RG58 cable? RG58. You know, you'd never uh -huh. use RG58 for UHF. No, I would have thought the loss would have been more than that. But That's enough. That's plenty. <laughs> well, let's see. Let's okay. see how much that is. Since you've kind of got the hang of it here now, tell me how we would, how, how you think we would solve this one? Well, we're going to make lose, this easier. We to need remember. to figure out what uh, 9 dB is. You're right. You got your choices of 3, 6, or 10 you can work with here. Well, 10, 10 is, well, we won't, we won't, but we want to figure 9, not the 100, right? So, uh, right. 3. Three is the one that goes into there three times. Easiest. You need to use the biggest you can get in there first. Okay, so then we'd have to go with a six then. A six. You say a six. Give me a six. All right, so the uh, we'll do the first minus six dB. So that's 100 watts. And how would we, what would we do with that? Well, six dB would be four times. But we're subtracting uh, yeah, it. Yeah, I know. So 100 divided by 4. That's 25 watts. 25 watts. Hmm. Now we still got 3 dB left over. So how are we going to handle that? Guess we're going to have to take the 25 watts. Okay. And subtract 3 dB from that. Oh, wait. We're going to have to divide? Yeah, I'm glad you remembered that. That's a hard part to remember right there. Divided by what? 3 dB set by 2. Because 2 is okay. uh, 3 dB is half. You, you're getting this. All right. It's so simple, even a dean could do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, there you go, Dean. You just solved it. If we had 163 feet of RG58 cable and used it at 440 megahertz, would have 9 dB of loss. Well, you may as well just use the rubber duck, man. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, out of your 100 watts, you'd only get 12.5 up to the antenna. Wow. That's pretty bad. 9 dB. In that case, 9 dB seems very drastic. It is very drastic. It is. It really is. Well, it was very interesting. Yeah, I Definitely. thought it was. I got another one. If you think that one was interesting. Oh, but wait, there's more? There's more. There's one more. And, you know, we always want to make sure the audience in the class gets their money's worth for the always tuition fees. For the, yeah. Oh, for the free tuition? 
So that's why we're throwing this one in as a bonus. Okay. Uh, let's say we're looking, well, at a satellite dish. And, you know, the feed horn in the center of that satellite dish is uh, LNB, mm -hmm. uh, low noise block converter. Mm -hmm. They used to use LNAs, but they use LNBs these days. That thing has a gain figure to it. Let's say we were uh, looking to buy a new LNB for our dish, and we had two different models there. We had one model that had a 43 dB gain and another one that had a 50 dB gain. All What's right, the difference? So 43 dB gain versus uh, 50. 50. And dB with a capital B because it's for bell. Decibel. Decibel. 50 dB one's going to cost $100 more. Is it worth it? Because look, I mean, we got we could get 43 dB for. Well, how much does 43 cost? Well, 43 dB is a hundred dollars less. Yeah, depends on what hundred dollars. Well, let's than say what. it's a hundred dollars. Okay, so the 50 dBs cost twice as much. Mm -hmm. Is it? No, I don't think it's going to be worth it. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's find out. Uh, how would we go about calculating this out? Well, I'm glad you asked, so because you, you get to answer it. Oh, I do. Okay. Well, you know, all I got to work with is three, six, or ten dB. Yeah. All right. So the first thing I'm going to figure out is the uh, the first, um, well, forty dB, because you know I got I can use ten. So to figure that out, I'm going to say ten times 10 times 10 times 10 equals 10,000. That's um, that's a pretty good bit of increase of received signal. Yeah, I'll say. We're not through yet. We've still got 3 dB to go. I'm glad I remembered that because it does make a difference. So for the next 3 dB, so 10,000 times 2. Wow, oh, so that, that's the kind of gain I'd like to have on my 2 meter antenna. Boy, aren't you? Aren't, yeah. So that 3 dB there, I mean, that got us up to an increase in the power of 20,000 times. Wow. That's pretty good. Our 50 dB L and B now, how would we calculate that out? To 10 to the fifth power. 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. What do you think that equals? A lot. Yeah, maybe 20,000 to 100,000. That might be worth 100 bucks. Yeah, might be, huh? Might be. Boy, that's quite a bit of increase. Just wanted to share that with you. A, a really simple way to do some uh, decibel gain and loss calculations for power. It'd be different now for voltage because, you know, voltage ratios are different. But it's a little bit of an eye opener, too, because you would it? just like just looking at that 43 to 50 dB. It's like, yeah, that's just 7 yeah. dB difference. But when you really calculate it out, that's a, that's massive. When you're down at the smaller numbers like 3, 6, or 9 dB, it can be some substantial changes. But when you get up into the bigger numbers like, you know, 53 dB, uh, pretty pretty big changes there. And that's so. why it's ham college and not ham grammar school. Right. Ham elementary school. And, you know, like a magician, you could just quote this out of your head now. Because we really didn't use a calculator. It's probably for that. a good way to dazzle the chicks at the bar, too. There you go. <laughs> that just paid That's for your class out. right there, didn't there it? There you go. Well, I've got a little video here um, of something. I, actually, I don't remember how long ago I shot this. Well, this is very different because we don't normally do videos on Ham College. That is. That is different. And this is a portion of a video I shot for Amateur Logic several years ago because we're going to talk about receivers tonight. We're going to need to know a little bit about super heterodyne re receivers. Well, this might be the difference between me getting a buzzer or not. It could be. And so rather than me sit here and try to explain this, I thought I've already explained this once. 
you just and, play this of you sitting here explaining this. Right. And the last time I did it, the presentation was so riveting that I thought, well, we'll just play that. This segment is going to contain mostly drawings and charts, but I think if you can stay awake through it, when we're finished, you'll understand a lot more about radio receivers and what an IF is. To begin, let's take a look at a typical receiver block diagram. The first element we see on the left is the antenna where the signal is received off the air. The antenna feeds an RF amplifier usually, which increases the level of the signal. The local oscillator produces a radio signal that is combined in the mixer with the RF signal being picked up off the air. The byproduct of the two is called the intermediate frequency. Now intermediate frequencies are used for three general reasons. At very high frequencies, uh, signal processing circuitry performs poorly and it's also uh, kind of difficult for ordinary circuits using capacitors and inductors to tune higher frequencies. A second reason is that uh, in a receiver that can tune different stations, you would have to convert the different frequencies in all the stages of the radio to actually decode it. Using an intermediate frequency, uh, we just have a tunable oscillator that we adjust the frequency on, and then everything below the mixer operates on a single frequency. But the main reason that we use intermediate frequency is to improve the frequency selectivity of the receiver. When we're dealing with a single frequency, it's easier for us to build filters that perform better. Typical AM radio receivers, the IF frequency is 455 kilohertz. In commercial FM receivers, it's usually 10.7 megahertz. The IF frequency of my Kenwood TS2000 is 10.695 megahertz. So it's not very far off the uh, typical FM IF frequency. A lot of uh, HF receivers have an IF frequency that's in the 8 MHz range. Now after the mixer and the IF frequency is produced, the next stage is the detector where the audio is actually demodulated into an audio signal that is fed to the AF or audio frequency amplifier and then fed on to our headphones or our speakers, whatever we're listening to. And that's the way a typical receiver works. To better understand how this IF frequency works, let's take a detailed look. This is a chart of the 80 meter amateur radio band, which in the United States extends from 3.5 to 4 megahertz. Now, if we tuned in a single frequency in that band, let's say 3.825 megahertz, our IF frequency is going to be 10.695 megahertz. As a matter of fact, no matter what frequency we tune in on the radio, the IF frequency is always going to be 10.695 megahertz. Let's assume that the TS2000 has a 50 kilohertz IF bandwidth. That means that uh, what we're actually getting is a signal that stretches from 10.67 MHz to 10.72 MHz, with 10.695 being in the center of that, and that is the signal that we'll demodulate and listen to. Let's tune in a different frequency, say 3.7 MHz. Our IF bandwidth is still the same, and the same frequencies are involved. Even if we tune to the 10 meter amateur radio band, our IF frequency is still 10.695 megahertz. Now let's zoom in to take a little closer look at what I'm going to call the virtual tuning range or the actual IF bandwidth. Now coming from the radio, it's actually 10.67 megahertz to 10.72 megahertz. But what we'll be receiving within that range is the over-the-air frequencies that are between 28.175 and 28.225 megahertz. Now that's 50 kilohertz of range. Our receiver is typically only looking at around 3 kilohertz of signal for a sideband signal. That's a classic right there from 2010. Yeah. If you think about it, how many dB ago was that? <laughs> Eight, eight years. Yeah. 
it's too much math. I hear you. Yeah, we've done. We're done with. No, we're not done with math for tonight. We're close to. Done no, with it, but I've done enough for the moment. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm I'll not tell you. sure the audience can handle too much math at one time. Yeah. All right. We need to get on into our questions here. But, um, you know, I think the dean and the professor could take a quick break right now. That sounds uh, like a plan. And we will be right back and get right on into the exams. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. ICOM's newest SDR transceiver, the IC9700, is coming soon. This new radio is bringing direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world. The IC9700 all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features, such as dedicated amateur satellite operation, color touchscreen, built-in D-Star capability, RF direct sampling on 2 meters and 70 centimeter bands, dual independent receivers capable of full duplex operation as well as dual watch, 100 watts maximum output power on 2 meters, 75 watts max on 70 centimeters, and 10 watts max on 1.2 gigahertz. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Attention all hams! ICOM knows that ham clubs play a big role in bringing ham communities together to learn from their peers and industry leaders. As a way to give back and help you on your mission, ICOM has launched a promotion exclusively for U.S. ham clubs and the ham fest they're involved with. By registering your club, you could win ICOM swag, a Skype presentation for your club, or your ham fest an ICOM booth setup. Register today for your chance to win at icomamerica.com hams. Pack your bags because Dayton Hamvention is coming up from May 17th through 19th at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. See the latest and greatest ICOM gear and meet hams from all over the world. Looking forward to Dayton again? Yes, sir. I am. I am. Too. I bought my plane tickets the other day. This will be going to be the first time I've actually had to pay for a plane ticket to go there. Yeah. It, it should be much easier on your arms. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to be easier on my wallet. Yeah. Well, yeah, you've gotten off easy. I've been paying for mine every year I've gone. Yeah. So. What is another term for the mixing of two RF signals? Is it A, heterodyning? B, synthesizing? C, cancellation? Or D, phase inverting? Well, what is another term for the mixing of two RF signals? And I... I just saw a nice little video, and uh, after watching the video and understanding what the topic of one of tonight's uh, one of tonight's topics are, I'm going to have to go with a heterodyning. Yeah, and you know I've always, for whatever reason, called it heterodyning all these years, and it is heterodyning. Is the, is the real oh yeah term there? I'm going to agree with you. I mean, I think that was kind of a, a this given. This was a freebie. Yeah, that's a freebie. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to give you a fist bump on that one. No, nah, I probably just... don't deserve one for that one. It would have okay. been pretty embarrassing if I'd have missed that one. It would have been. All right, your turn. Oh, no, it's not. It's my turn. To read my it. turn to answer. What is the simplest combination of so I forget so much since the last one. What is the simplest combination of stages that implement a superheterodyne receiver? A RF amplifier, detector, audio amplifier. B RF amplifier, mixer, and IF discriminator. C HF oscillator, mixer, detector. Or D HF oscillator. Prescaler and audio amplifier. What is the simplest combination of stages that implement a super heterodyne receiver? Uh, a RF amplifier detector and audio amplifier. No, that would be a simple receiver, but not a super heterodyne. B RF amplifier mixer IF discriminator. Or you would think that sounds like some official stuff there, mm -hmm. but I don't think there's such a thing as an IF discriminator. Um, D, 
HF oscillator, prescaler, and audio amplifier. Those are all things that you would see in a receiver, but that doesn't make it a super heterodyne. We've got to have a mixer for that. So I'm going to say it's C, HF oscillator, mixer, and detector. Okay. What do you think? Is that your final answer? That's my final answer. Going once. You go for it. Okay. What circuit is used to combine signals from the IF amplifier and BFO and send the results to the AF amplifier in some single sideband receivers? Is it A, RF oscillator? B, IF filter? Or C, balanced modulator? Or D, product detector? Hmm. Okay, I don't know this one, so I'm going to have to try to reason this out. What circuit is used to com combine signals from the IF amplifier and the BFO? Send the result to the AF amplifier and some single sideband receivers. It's not the os it's not a RF oscillator because that doesn't combine signals. IF filter doesn't combine combined uh, signals and I don't think balance balance modulator combined signals D product detector it's probably it's going to be between C and D product detector yeah both of those sound pretty official uh-huh combined signals from the IF amplifier and the BFO send the result to the AF amplifier. Well, the, the chat yeah, room's don't look not, at the chat. That's room. not much help because they're between both of those. Yep. So at least you know you're on the right track. Yeah. The last half. I'm just gonna have to guess. I don't think it's the mo I don't think it's the modulator because that see that would be on the transmit side. I'm going to have to go with D, the product detector. Although uh, this is just strictly a guess. Uh, it's a, modulator, a pretty good guess. Modulator, because these one of those other ones seem like they really worked out in my mind. Yeah, well, it it balanced modulator was the trick answer there. Yeah, so that would have been on the transmit. That would be side. on the the transmit side. And yeah, yeah so. And the other, the other two A and B didn't even didn't match to me yep. at all. So that so was only the other one that made that made mm -hmm. sense to me. So that was a, you pulled that one off pretty good because it was kind of an even split between. Well, when the I first C's saw it up there, I was thinking that buzzer was about to go off. Yeah. It, but there's still time. I was hoping. Yeah, I'm sure mm -hmm. you were. <laughs> okay, well, let's see if it'll go off this time. What circuit is used to process signals from the RF amplifier and local oscillator, then send the result to the IF filter in a super heterodyne receiver? A, balanced modulator. Well, I know it's not that now. <laughs> B, IF amplifier. Uh, C, mixer. Or D, detector. I think I know what this one is. What circuit is used to process signals from the RF amplifier and local oscillator, then send the result to the IF filter in a super heterodyne receiver? Well, yeah. Um, what we're doing is we're taking the signals coming from our local oscillator and from the RF amplifier, what's coming off the antenna, and we're combining them together. It's a mixer. Because a super heterodyne receiver, it will have a detector, but that's not what's being used to process the signals or combine those two signals together to give us, um, you know, uh, what we're going to send on to the detector. So it's not balanced modulator. That would that would be in a transmitter. It's not the IF amplifier, although, you know, there could be an IF amplifier in, in that receiver. It doesn't have to be. 
Uh, it's not the detector because that's what actually is detecting the product of, you know, what we've received from the mixer. So I'm going to say C mixer. Everybody says C over in the chat room. I got a pretty good feeling about this answer. Well, that's what I would have guessed, too, I think. Yep. Well, let's see what you guess on this one. What receiver stage combines a 14.250 megahertz input signal with a 13.795 megahertz oscillator signal to produce a 455 kilohertz intermediate frequency IF signal? Is it A, a mixer? B, BFO? C, a VFO? Or D, discriminator. Ooh, yuck. What receiver stage combines a 14250 signal with the 13795? I don't think it's a mixer because that's not what the... I don't think, unless I'm not looking at it right, that doesn't match the question that we just had come up there. Uh, that for what a mixer does. A BFO, that's the beat frequency oscillator. So we've already got the oscillator for variable frequency oscillators, VFO. That leaves D, discriminator. I'm not 100% sure what the discriminator job is, but I think that's the answer. D? I think it's D. Okay. But I don't know why that's the answer. So maybe if it is, then you can clear it up or tell me why I'm wrong. But I don't. I, well, that's what that's what I would pick. Okay. If I were taking it down. Well, I won't need to clear that up because everybody's saying A in the chat room except for one D, and I happen to know it's A. Uh, that it is A. Yeah. Oh, the the key there is what receiver stage combines. Okay. That's the magic word. Combines the uh, the input signal along well, with the local oscillator. Yeah. Yep, that was a mighty nice buzzer there. We, you know, we've been we've been missing those here yeah. on the show. Well, lately. there you go. I, I think I need a drink after that one. <laughs> Out of a silver can, a can of water. Yeah, seltzer water. Yep. Oh, I just blew that one bad, man. If a receiver mixes a 13.8 megahertz VFO with a 14.255 megahertz received signal to produce a 455 kilohertz intermediate frequency IF signal, what type of interference will be? <laughs> will a 3 point or 13.345 megahertz signal produced in the receiver. Wow. wow, that's a mouthful. Yeah. A, quadrature noise. B, image response. C, mixer interference. Or D, intermediate interference. Okay. Well, let me just do some quick math here, which I'll probably fell out miserably since I'm addicted to a calculator and this this is not a DB question. You want the calculator? Uh, nothing, you're welcome to, you can use that. Well, I'll tell you what. Just don't go to the web page. Let's, let me just try out something here. Take uh, let's see 13.8 and so well uh, Subtract 4.55. I really should have said 13,800 minus 455. Okay. You got a clear on that? That's an apple, isn't it? 13.800? Mm-hmm. Minus 455. Minus 441.2? That's not right. It's an apple. It might be wrong. Well, well, yeah, it's not a negative number, I know. Well, you just subtracted uh, thirteen eight hundred. Yeah. Thirteen. Not yeah. Yeah. One, one three, three eight. Dot. No, not dot. Oh. 
I was, I was doing that. Yeah. Minus four fifty five. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thirteen thousand three forty five. Oh, the same number we got there. Okay, so that is sort oh. of harmonically related, or that is a multiple of of that math there. So. What kind of interference is it going to produce in a receiver? I don't think it'll be quadrature noise. I um, don't even know what quadrature noise is. And I don't think it'll be intermediate interference because whatever's doing the interfering would have to be around 455 kilohertz itself to do that, I think. I don't believe it'd be mixer interference. I think what it would be is image response because that frequency just happens to be 455 kilohertz off from our VFO. And I think, and the reason I'm thinking that is because I remember image, uh, images being a problem with some software defined radio kits and all that I built and played with, mm -hmm. you'd see a signal there on the band and then right down from that you'd see the same exact signal again. Oh yeah. Uh, but let, let's just see if if that is right. What are they saying in the chat room? They're saying it's either B or a C. Mostly yeah. B's. I'm going to stay with the B. And got that one right. Oh, cool. Okay. All right. We didn't actually have to use the calculator to do that, but I just wanted to see if that was where it would produce, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a signal at, and so that kind of helped me verify what I was thinking there. What is one reason to use the attenuator function that is present on many HF transceivers? Is it A, to reduce signal overload due to strong incoming signals? B, to reduce the transmitter power when driving a linear amplifier. C, to reduce power consumption when operating from batteries. Or D, to slow down received CW signals for better copy. Well, it's not D. I could say that beyond any shadow of a doubt. Okay. Attenuator, that's usually going to reduce the level of something. So reduce power consumption. And uh, attenuator function to reduce the signal overload due to strong incoming signals. That's going to be the answer. Uh, A, B, to reduce transmitter power. You, you could just turn the power down. Attenuator, it's going to be A. The answer is A. Oh, that's what everyone's saying in the chat room. I'm going to agree with you. And it is. Hey. Are you new to the ham world or an existing amateur operator who wants to take your license to the next level? Study for your radio license exam at hamstudy.org. Hamstudy.org is a free online learning tool powered by ICOM. It was created by Richard Bateman, KD7BBC, Michael Stuffelbeam, KV9G, and Rich Porter, KK6GKE, and it uses a modern web design to enhance the experience of studying for your technician, general, and amateur extra exams. Since 2013, hamstudy.org has helped new and existing hams to familiarize themselves with the question pools, use stats-based flashcards to focus on material they need to learn, and take practice exams to gauge progress. Visit hamstudy.org on your desktop computer or mobile device. Register for a free account at hamstudy.org to access personalized study history and other site features. Prepare for an exam in an intuitive and comprehensive manner. Check out hamstudy.org powered by ICOM for free learning tools. Good luck on your next exam. I found a nice ICOM ball cap in ICOM T-shirt, ham crew T-shirt. You know what? 
People going to Dayton Hamvention would look really good wearing this well, around there. They would. They sure would. That the the T shirt, I mean, you know, that spells it out right there. Ham and a, through an icon. Yeah, and a matching icon ball cap yeah, to go yeah. with it. And you're probably gonna want that cap for when the rain starts. Yep. Or so, the or or the sun's beating down on you sun. one or the other. One or the other. So it's a versatile cap. It's all weather cap. It is. So anyway, I hope you guys uh and ladies, put your uh, entry in to try to win that Where this month. Where would you enter? Well, it's pretty simple. Really, all you got to have is a name and an email address and send an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. It's pretty much that simple. And I guess we could do a random drawing of those entries and choose a winner. That's why you're the professor. <laughs> That's why. You know, it That's pays why. to go that extra step. It sure does. I'm just a dean, man. I just passed this stuff out, I saw. Well, <laughs> and you don't have to have anything in particular in that email. You can. No, you just send it. With, that's all you yeah. really got to do. You can do just like Glenn here. He sent an email to Ham College at AmateurLogic.tv that said, Enter me. 73 Glenn W3 WWT. There you go. That's all it takes. And Glenn, that, there you go. You're a lucky winner. Yeah, there you go, Glenn. Paid off for you, man. And uh, congratulations on winning it. They'll be, they'll be contacting you soon. Yep. If, uh, if you entered and you didn't win, enter again uh, for next month. So everything gets, the queue gets cleared out and we start over clean every month. So, uh, Go back and send your entry in. So hopefully you'll win next time. Yep. Anyway, congrats, Glenn. What is the purpose of the notch filter found on many HF transceivers? A, to restrict the transmitter voice bandwidth. B, to reduce interference from carriers in the receiver passband. C, to eliminate receiver interferences, interference from impulse noise sources. Or D, to enhance the reception of a specific frequency on a crowded band. What is the purpose of a notch filter found on many HF transceivers? It's a notch, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's a filter that's cutting out something. Yeah, so you're going to you're gonna like null out one little section. Okay. To enhance the reception of a specific frequency on a crowded band. No, because it's, it's not a peaking filter, it's a notch filter, so no, it's going to eliminate something. Um, C, to eliminate receiver interference from impulse noise sources. No, because impulse noise is broad-banded. I mean, that's, that's like spark plug noise or... You know, yeah, that like our spark gap transmitter we made back in the technician exactly. section. That thing's broadband. Mm -hmm. you, you put a notch filter on it, you're not going to eliminate anything. Um, a, to restrict the transmit transmitter voice bandwidth. No, there again, the notch is just going to cut out a little hole in the middle somewhere, wherever you tune it to. And those are from receivers anyways, right? Well, typically it would be. I mean, you could make one for uh, for RF, but it would only notch it out. It wouldn't control the overall bandwidth. It's just going to take a little hunk out of the middle of it wherever you tune it. So I'm going to say it's B, to reduce interference from carriers in the receiver passband. And let's see what everybody's saying in the chat room. Oh, they're, they're saying B. It's got to be right then. Yep. You know, if uh, if you're on HF and somebody key, and you're on sideband, somebody keys up a transmitter right near you, it's what's it gonna do? It's gonna kind of heterodyne effect. So mm -hmm. it's gonna cause a whistle or a tone mm -hmm. to be picked up on your receiver, and if it's real narrow. So if you've got a notch filter, you can tune it right on that offending signal and, and take yeah, it right Yeah, it can out. really clean it up a lot. Yep. Um, and those have been around on, on HF receivers for a good while now. Even, uh, you know, some of the older ones have that. 
Uh, some of the new ones got auto notch in it, so it automatically finds the frequency and notches it out for you. That is pretty nice. Cool. Okay, which of the following can perform automatic notching of interfering carriers? Is it A, bandpass tuning? <clears throat> B, a digital signal processor or DSP filter? <clears throat> B, balanced mixing? Or D, a noise limiter? It's not going to be D, noise limiter. That, does, that works on a pretty broad range and balanced mixing. Uh, bandpass tuning is is very cool stuff, but I don't think that's the answer here. I think it's going to be B, digital signal processor, DSP filter. It seemed like that would be what uh, would perform that. Yeah, perform. out of the choices you got there. Bandpass, that's where you're going to, that's kind of the opposite, where you're going to like, yeah, exactly. you know, things on both sides, and you're only going to get the yeah. band, the piece of the band that you want where uh, notch is going to actually cut out a piece in the in the middle or to the side or whatever so it's got to be B digital signal processor DSP that's what they're saying in the chat room I'm going to agree with them okay uh, those choices a digital signal processor would be great for performing automatic notching yep Which of the following is an advantage of a receiver DSP IF filter as compared to an analog filter? A. A wide range of filter bandwidths and shapes can be created. B. Fewer digital components are required. C. Mixing products are greatly reduced. Or D. The DSP filter is much more effective at VHF frequencies. Which of the following is a advantage of a receiver DSP IF filter as compared to an analog filter. Alright, well let me just start off the first one. Uh, I'm going to rule out D. The DSP filter is much more effective at VHF frequencies because you remember way back when Radio Shack sold some little DSP filters? That yeah, a little could, speaker? Well, no, this was a, a little unit. It wasn't a speaker. It was, um, I think you put it in line with the speaker. I don't remember now. I bought one of them. Oh. But it didn't help, and I was only on two meters back then. It didn't help anything. It didn't help at all. No. All right, so. Could it have been that it was made from Radio Shack, huh? No, it's because it, the kind of noise you got on the <laughs> FM okay. is not going to help it on VHF frequencies. That was a good bait there, though. You know, I took it just <laughs> hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> a wide range of filter bandwidth and shapes can be created. That sounds plausible. Uh, yeah. Fewer digital components are required. What's the advantage of a receiver DSPI filter as compared to an analog filter? Analog filter wouldn't need any digital components, so I know that's not right. Uh, I know it wouldn't D, so mixing products are greatly reduced. Nah. Uh, DSP filter, you know, that allows us to do some uh, creative carving there on the signals we're dealing with. So I'd say, yeah, a wide range of filter bandwidth and shapes can be created. That's uh, a, that sounds right to me. That, yeah. There you go. Nailed it. Nailed no, it. Here, you had none of these. Here, we yeah. hadn't had any of that tonight. No. Had to do at least one. Which of the following is a function of a digital signal processor? A, to provide adequate grounding. B, to remove noise from received signals. C, to increase antenna gain. Or D, to increase antenna bandwidth. I think we pretty much cleared this up a while ago. To provide adequate grounding, no thank you, that's uh, totally unrelated. C, to increase antenna gain is unrelated, and increase antenna bandwidth is unrelated. So that leaves B, Bravo. To 
to remove noise from received signals. And that's what they're they're saying in the chat room. I agree with you. It'd be you. pretty hard to miss that one. Yeah. Unless you didn't have any idea what a digital signal processor was. Yeah, but if you made it to this point, you yeah. most likely you do. You've heard random chatter about it, at least, I'm sure. Yeah, at least have a clue what it yeah. is. Which of the following is needed for a digital signal processor IF filter? A, an analog to digital converter. B, a digital to analog converter. C, a digital processor chip. Or D, all of these choices are correct. Hmm. I think you're going to need all of those because you're starting out with an analog signal. Yep. Uh, coming from your IF, you're going to need to convert that analog signal to digital. All right. Then you're going to want to do some processing on it. You're going to need a, a digital processor chip to do that. And then since your ear can't understand digital, you're going to have to convert the digital back to analog. I say it's D. I concur. And, and so does the chat room. I concur, Professor. Yep. So there we go, number D. All right. Number D. How is digital... Boy, there's a lot of questions on this. I mean... How is digital signal processor filtering accomplished? A, by using direct signal phasing. B, by converting the signal from analog to digital and using digital processing. C, by differential spurious phasing. <laughs> D, by converting the signal from digital to analog and taking the difference of mixing products. How is digital signal processor filtering, filtering accomplished. It's not by using direct signal phasing. I don't think. B, by converting the signal from analog to digital. Yeah. B, I think that might be it. Or C, by differential spurious phasing. No. D, by converting the signal from digital to analog. Nope. Digital signal processing is going to be accomplished by B. Bravo by converting the signal from analog to digital and using digital processing. I'll agree, and so does the chat room. I feel like I almost gave that one away. Why? Because of what I said in my answer before that. But Oh, uh, I mean, it's the only one that really makes sense. It, true, yeah. You know, differential spurious phasing... We don't even know what that is. It may not even be such a thing. No. It sounds pretty impressive, though. It if does. You can pull it off. What does an... Oh, wow. We go from difficult to like... To, what does an S meter measure? A, conductance. B, impedance. C, receive signal strength. Or D, transmitter power output. What does an S meter measure? S is... I think most people will get this one. I would hope so. I would hope so. Um, doesn't measure conductance, impedance, or transmitter output power. So that only leaves received signal strength. Now I could see where some people could get this wrong because if you look at uh, HF radio, the same meter has a scale on there for reading S units and power and maybe mm -hmm. modulation and AGC, any number of things. Yep. But set as an S meter, it's going to be received signal strength. They're all getting that right over the chat room, too. Where is an S meter found? A, one in person. A receiver? Hmm? One person chose S. Yeah, I think it must have been a typo. No, no I'm yeah. sure. Oh, yes. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Where is an S meter found? In a receiver? Oh, yeah. Or B, in an SWR bridge. C, in a transmitter. Or D, in a conductance bridge. Well, pretty much narrowed it down a while ago that it's in, in a receiver. Because uh, the transmitter 
shows the transmitter power. The receiver shows the signal strength. See, there again, I gave away the answer. You're the best one on my team, man. <laughs> like I said, I'm looking out for you. you know? um, so the answer is number A in a receiver. Well, everybody's <laughs> agreeing with you in the chat room over there. <laughs> All right, one final question tonight. It would have been shameful had I missed it. It would have been pretty bad. I mean, I would have... I would have Rick rolled you on that one. Or oh something. no, yeah. not Rick roll. Is that even still a thing? I don't know. I hadn't heard it in a long time. I don't know where it came up with it from. Peter used to be the world's worst to do that. I need to send him an email with that on it. He used to do that to me every now and then. Yeah. What type of circuit is used in many FM receivers to convert signals coming from the IF amplifier to audio? Uh, a product detector. B, phase inverter. C, mixer. Or D, discriminator. What type of circuit is used in many FM receivers to convert signals coming from the IF amplifier to audio? You know this one, I'm sure. I, don't, um, I think I know this one. In an FM receiver, to take that audio off of the IF, well, let's With your see. job, you should know. This yeah. should be a breeze. It's not a phase inverter. It's not B. It's not C, a mixer. So that gets us down to a discriminator or a product detector. And I believe the product detector is used for single sideband signals because a discriminator is used to uh, you know, detect AM or excuse me, detect FM receiver signals. It's D. And everybody's got that over in the chat room too. Yeah. Number D. Number D. And if I am correct, that is the final question for tonight's episode. We got there with only one buzzer in the process and Well that didn't hurt much. No? It didn't hurt too bad, did it? The questions weren't too bad tonight. There were a couple that were yeah, there's a, yeah, tough there's a couple, there. couple, but they weren't yeah, they weren't too bad. Yeah, we were talking earlier about Dayton coming up. Yeah, and how you could win, you know, uh, the ICOM swag there uh, just by sending that email to Ham College at AmateurLogic.tv. Yep. All you need is a name and an email address. Mm -hmm. But you know, ham invention lasts more than one day. It does. You and don't want to wear that same shirt because sometimes it gets kind of hot. And well, uh, it get, does. That thing, yeah. As nice as that shirt is, it could get kind of gamey by the third day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you might want to change. Uh, what would you wear it in addition to that? Hey, I got an idea. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah. How about some nice amateur logic or ham college? swag. Where could I find such? You can get some right there. It just so happens it's on the screen. Amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com Wow. You what? can get t-shirts. You can get a, a ball cap if your other one gets too wet. If you win the icon one, you can get uh, one for a dry day. Because it, it has been known to come up a pretty good shower there from time to time. That's what I was thinking, yeah. That could be handy to have. Yeah. So, uh, -huh. uh We've also got some jackets on there in case it gets cold. Get a jacket as well. <laughs> yeah. Cool. The only thing we don't have is socks and underwear on there. But if you give me a few minutes, we could probably have some of those on and, there too. And galoshes. I think those would be, <laughs> would be nice. You know? Yeah. Seriously, though, uh, if you do, if you're going to Dayton, if you got this, the swag, be sure to look us up and, uh, and get your picture taken. Say hello if you see us walking around. Yes, most definitely, whether yeah. you got the swag or not. Yeah, we we don't uh, like I said we don't really make anything off of those things. It's just a lot of people asked for them, so they're there for you guys. Yep. So what if you wanted to stay in contact with us throughout the month? Well, so if you had some questions about your homework or something. Well, you know we've got uh, two places on Twitter. We've got uh, we've also got Facebook. Yeah, we also got. <laughs> 
<laughs> Facebook <laughs> groups. Uh, Facebook.com slash group slash ham college. Or slash amateur logic. Or, or slash amateur logic, which is the more busy of the of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, or you can follow us on Twitter at ham college or at amateur logic. I would sure. say you could go to Google Plus, but I think about two more days and that's going to be gone. That's going away. So, uh, unfortunately. I think I made my last post there this evening. I posted that we'd be oh, yeah. shooting the show tonight. Yeah, it so. was a good run while it lasted. Uh, yeah. But I, I really hate to see that, but anyway, that's that's how it kind of goes sometimes. Yep, me too. And, um, you know, I think, like I said before, if Google can't dominate the world with it, they're not going to throw it out. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, sorry, but thanks for everyone who's participated in our uh, Google Plus communities. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the only other real community we got right now is uh, Facebook and Twitter. So join us at one of those. If we decide to do something else, we'll let yeah, you know. Yeah, and you know, uh, I was going to also say, you know, the majority of the pictures, the swag pictures came in through Google Plus. They did. So, uh, you know, if, you, if you've got swag pictures and, and Google Plus is gone, uh, we still like to see those things. If you're not a Facebook user, which I understand a lot of people aren't, and that's fine. But we've, we've got email. Old so school. You, huh? Old school. Yeah, yeah, go old school and use uh, email. You can do snail mail if you really want to, but uh, yeah. email's, email's good. So, um, you know, you can reach us there. Our email addresses are always in the credits of both shows. That, yep, that's true. And one other thing we want to mention, and that is uh, our wiki. You can get the official show notes at amateurlogic.tv slash wiki. Our friend Dan in 9LVS does those for us. <clears throat> and uh, usually, you know, it's just uh, sort of basically what was on a topic on the show tonight. Maybe we had some links or something we wanted to share with you. Those would be in there. So thanks, Dan, for doing that. And I see in the chat room somebody put on here. I think they're talking about uh, Star Wars. Uh, see, I'm your father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate. I, I was waiting for somebody to say I'm my own grandpa on there. You remember that old song? Yeah. Not well, but I yeah, I just kind it. of vaguely remember it too. Yeah. Pretty funny stuff, though. Yeah, that was my aunt's favorite song. Really? Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> well, maybe we should use that for the exit music. If YouTube wouldn't flag us. Oh, they would. Sure. Somebody's copyrighted that, no doubt. Oh, yeah. You know, they copyrighted the Lincoln, sure. That was so like sure. A, oh, yeah. The thing that uh, on the number station, Peter did a segment years ago. Uh-huh. Somebody had copyrighted. Oh, that, oh, wow. Which I don't see how they did it, but they, they did. Anyhow, I think that's going to do it for tonight's class. Uh, we appreciate everyone showing up tonight. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't mark anybody down as tardy. No. Nope. I will say Mike says he rickrolled Marty twice in 10 minutes. Did he break some kind of record? I think he may have. He, well, he's almost up with Peter. <laughs> so. <laughs> so bring yeah. back Rick, the Rick roll, huh? Bring it back. <laughs> no, don't. No, <laughs> that was don't. a terrible song. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for being here, everyone. Um, join us again next month for the next time college I don't know what we're going to be talking about yet. We covered all the receiver questions tonight. We usually never know until we get up here. True. True. So um, It'll be something good, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, join us for Amateur Logic coming up around the 15th of March. Yep, that's always a big time. And uh, join us, you know, on one of the social media uh, sites there. And say hello or send us an email. You know, we take those too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Yeah, the Google Plus people don't uh, don't disappear. So, uh, like I said, yeah. emails are great. We we love getting those as well. Yeah. All right, seventh through everyone. Thanks for being here and uh, give it the old alma mater cheer. Yep, yeah, seventh through everybody.
That and 50 cents still won't even get you a cup of coffee. Yeah, you know, speaking of 50 cents, yeah, not, not to get <laughs> sidetracked here, but you know that's the way it the teachers that do much. often. You know, you want something to keep it entertaining. We got a new dog. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that black dog yet. Yeah, I saw him barking at me when okay. I heard I more, heard him one. more than I saw him. That's the one. Um, that dog stole a dollar bill out of my wife's purse. Oh, wow. And we only found half of it. <laughs> so they gave her the nickname 50 Cent. Oh, nice. Yeah. Anyway, back to our <laughs> lesson. That's what we got to do is uh, subtract. Or subtract. <laughs> subtract.